Have you heard of Entropy Zero? Please play Entropy Zero 1 and 2. Now play Entropy hey, Zero. Yeah, this is a really great Half-Life 2 mod called Entropy Zero. It's awesome. You should check it out. Entropy Zero 2 is the closest thing I've ever seen. Entropy Zero now. 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 You should play Entropy Zero now. I get it! Yeah, I know I rehashed the joke from my Half-Life 1 review, but... It just felt right, okay? As many of you know, or should know, I would hope, considering you're watching an in-depth review of a mod that aims to basically be Half-Life 3, we never got Half-Life 3, or Half-Life 2, Episode 3. Same difference at this point. So Breadman, the creator of the Entropy series of mods, thought to continue the story of Half-Life not from the POV of Gordon Freeman, but from a new character, a Combine Metro Cop we come to know as Aiden Walker, aka 3650, aka Bad Cop. No! I'm with the science team! Before we get into all that malarkey, I'd like to first thank you all for the love on my review of the Left 4 Dead series. Leave a comment for a chance to be featured in the next video, and my final thanks go to my patrons. Stin, Dotman, Brian, Angel, Defoe 3, Papa Noob 345, Dominic, Dominique, Kevin, Bradley, Mark, 13th Mortimer, Nindota, Micah, Devin, Sadiq, and Bryce. Entropy Zero is technically a flashback game, a recording 11 months prior to present day being reviewed from the helmet of the Combine Metro Cop, Aiden Walker. Something I never had a good chance to go over in my reviews of Half-Life 2 was the whole hierarchy of the Combine. So Bad Cop here is a member of Civil Protection, a group of humans who <coughs> volunteer to basically become the Combine's police force in exchange for perks like better food, better living conditions, and access to VR porn. I joke, but you will come to find out that Aiden happily joined the Combine by choice for reasons that we'll get more into as the story unravels. There are more little variants among the hierarchy, but just know for now that Aiden is looking to become an elite soldier. For the meantime, time, he's stuck with the other bottom feeders of the Combine Overwatch looking to clear out a rebel outpost in the Outlands. Soon after, you flash forward to you and those same comrades taking, you guessed it, a train heading to City 17. The problem is, this is a video game, so inevitably the train crashes and everybody dies. The good news is, this is a video game, so everybody dies, except for you. And I love how Bad Cop assesses the situation like he's a mechanic or something. Ah, uh, she's just gotten flat. Don't worry, we'll have this baby up and running again in a jiffy. Re-emerging to the outside world, you find yourself in City 10, which you soon find out was abandoned due to the outbreak of the sea flu, a bacteria that apparently came from Zen, which is a pretty cool touch. It's dangerous not just to humans, but even the Combine. Hence the name. Despite City 10's epidemic, there's still a bunch of dumbass rebels out tailgating, and zombies of course. Truth is, with it now being the winter, the spread of the sea flu has slowed immensely, allowing the rebels to roll in and basically take over City 10, while the Combine had to evacuate. Now because you're the the combine in this scenario, you can use those annoying man hacks to deal with enemies. Oh shit! No, don't go into each other. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh -oh. These little guys are incredibly useful, and frankly just straight up overpowered in the early portions of the game, where you find yourself in lots of wide open spaces. Hell, they cleared out this entire street filled with rebels up ahead, enabling me to just focus on disabling their turrets. Unfortunately for this next chapter, the manhacks won't be able to help you out because this rebel outpost is FILLED with turrets, ready to light up ANYTHING that triggers them. To evade death, you have to pull some Looney Tunes level malarkey, pushing this wooden wheel in view of the rebels, while simultaneously sneaking behind it as cover. Okay, sure, but some of the times you get spotted is just complete horseshit. Towards the end here, you gotta push over these wooden planks before sneaking over to the store. Let me quickly peek outside and make sure there's no rebel standing there about to see me do that. This man is not even looking in my direction. His FOV must be on Quake Pro. Or how about this, where there's literally nobody in my field of view, yet I get spotted within a second of standing up with bushes for cover as well? Eventually, you learn to basically say screw it and just go, but it is a little weird that a stealth section feels like you can't even plan out much and you just have to wing it kind of goes against the whole point of being careful. You eventually find this dumbass who's even less careful than myself apparently, so as we look for a way to let him out, we also stumble upon this. Scribbled on the wall, a man by the name of Jim Halana. Yeah, I'm not summarizing all that shit because there's like no footage I could use to correlate with all that rambling. Just know that G-Man go bird. Right after freeing your buddy here, he knocks you unconscious and when you come to, it's revealed that your buddy was none other than that sly alcoholic fuck Barney Calhoun, who with the help of some rebels dumps you in a hole leaving you to rot. 
this point, the sea flu hasn't had any direct effect on gameplay, only being mentioned in passing. Below City 10, however, is where that all changes, as this is where rebels have been dumping the corpses of the infected to keep the bacteria from spreading above the surface. This leads not only to you eventually contracting the sea flu yourself, but also to you fighting all the undead combine underground who were unfortunate enough to contract it as well. Also unfortunate is the fact that your nav unit gets fried down here, meaning no more night vision. So the only way to navigate the dank tunnels and subways ahead is with the assistance of the Pixar lamp. What the fuck? The atmosphere in this area is incredible, and the concept behind this section as a whole I think is pretty cool, but man the stalkers are mind-numbingly slow. And you can't just grab the flares lying around and chuck them ahead to cheese this section because you need the stalker to open doors for you along the way, so you also have to keep the slow pace with him and keep him protected. It's pretty neat the first time playing the mod, but I would imagine replaying this section would be a slow. Okay. Oh. Can I get some health? Alright. Things speed up right after this section, though, as you take a razor train to City 10's mini citadel called Pillar 10. Oh. Oh! And then, things are immediately brought back to a screeching halt with this puzzle you have to do in this airlock. You come to find all these crates floating around you, and then in the middle of the room, there's these ten glowing buttons, where pressing them in a certain order, maybe, uh, will open a door on the other side of the room. However, behind the door is also a wall of lasers, so I thought maybe you had to press the buttons in another order to not only open the doors, but also deactivate the lasers. And after trying infinite combinations, apparently not. Okay, what if I can maybe tamper with the pressure of the airlock to float up to something that can deactivate them. No. No, all you have to do is shoot an energy ball at this light above the door. <sighs> Why is there a 10 button puzzle to open up this one silly stupid door? You don't even have to use the air to float up to hit the reactor or whatever. You can just do it flat footed from the floor. And Okay, look. Yes, there's that arrow pointing up to the light with the symbol for the energy ball thing. Maybe this is on me. But when you've got 10 flashing buttons grabbing all my attention that feel like they're supposed to be grabbing all of my attention, wouldn't you think they'd have more to do with the puzzle as a whole? I don't know. Again, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's my fault. Thanks to all those infected corpses you pass by down here, you've contracted the sea flu. And to keep from dying, you have to hop into these vaccination stations to kill the spread and restore your health. I've noticed a lot of people being down on this mechanic, but it didn't really bother me, honestly, because even when the sea flu wasn't affecting me, I would hop into the pods whenever I was low on health in general. So because I was hopping into them so often, the flu pretty much never triggered anyway. I can totally understand why people would be annoyed by by this. Hell, even the creator of the mod admitted himself that the sea flu was a massive mistake. But for my playstyle, I don't know, just didn't really phase me, I guess. Throughout Pillar 10, you'll continue to encounter Vortigons who show great interest in the thing keeping this whole place powered, known as the Quantanode, which utilized an unknown science of zero entropy stasis technology. Laser arrays in the structure were focused onto a singularity that siphoned heat energy from its surroundings to create a sub-zero fusion reaction to power Pillar 10 and the Combine technology throughout the city. Okay, I read that pretty much verbatim from a Steam community page. I'm not gonna act like I know exactly what any of that means. But basically, this has allowed the humans to hijack combine technology like you saw with those turrets earlier. But it doesn't stop there. Also, shout out to the homie Laszlo. <laughs> Sorry about that, dude. Not only have the rebels learned to turn the turrets against you, but now the Vortigaunts are even turning the Combine's hunters against you as well. I feel like I've ragged on this mod a good amount so far, but this? This is awesome. You can't even deny that, okay? This is sick like the sea flu. The fight against it does end a bit anticlimactically though, it does sort of just scamper off. Oh no, it's back! As you advance further up the tower, you find a squad of Combine soldiers who have been frozen due to the frigid temperatures being generated by the pillar's core. It's here that you have a hectic final showdown with a group of Vortigons, destroying a bunch of things around the room while abusing the hell out of healing stations until all the Vortigons are dead. With the last Vortigon slayed, a zero entropy event occurs, freezing everything inside the core, yourself included. And it's here that the recording ends and you're brought to the present day, finding yourself in Nova Prospect and confronted by a Combine advisor 
advisor. The Grub explains that they were able to recover you from City 10, as you miraculously survived thanks to being put in a sort of stasis field emitted by the core. With the looming threat of an old foe returning, the advisor deems you worthy of that promotion you've worked so hard for, and your consciousness is very, very painfully transferred and copied to be used in the future among the Combine's finest elite soldiers. Congratulations, son! You are now all elite! And yes, while it may feel like I ragged on this mod a good bit, I want to make it clear that it's extremely commendable that Breadman made this all by himself. I mean, I could never make something like this, and despite any of my criticisms, I don't want to take anything away from him. There's lots of great concepts and ideas here just waiting to be polished and fully fleshed out. Luckily, Entropy Zero 2, which wasn't even supposed to happen, does just that and then some. I only had one thing to give up for this job. My humanity. Some would say. I never had it anyway. Entropy 2 actually begins even further before Entropy 1 does, not long before 36's first mission with some of his fellow Metro Cops. You come to find that 36 is looked down upon by everybody, really, mocked for being a teacher's pet and a bootlicker. Side note, unlike the last game, literally every cop around here has unique interactable dialogue. That's the first of 2047 things Entropy 2 does better than its predecessor. While cleaning some vents of head crabs, you can overhear some of the other pricks performing a background check on you, as they discover that your wife died and your daughter Ava was kidnapped. But with no leads and feeling pressure from the public, the police blamed you, presuming that you murdered your own daughter, and this is where it becomes clear why Aiden joined the Combine. Feeling outcasted, isolated, and betrayed by humanity, he seeks to rise up the ranks of the Combine in the hopes of using their resources to find out who took his daughter. Hearing that other members of Civil Protection are looking to sabotage him, Aiden is driven into a rage. After this, he was put on Outland's duty, and the rest is history. Fast forward to the present day, and we find Aiden's consciousness transferred into a Combine elite soldier. During another conversation with an advisor, we find out that these events are occurring pretty much immediately after the death of Wallace Breen. With that, we are now put on the hunt for Judith Mossman, as the Combine look to interrogate her to learn everything she knows. Hunt down the Mossman. As the supposed last clone of Aiden, for this assignment we've been granted the privilege of having our faculties like memory and free will restored, as unlike typical Combine Elite who usually have all that totally wiped, 36 performs better with these faculties. But that's just what they want you to think. The mission begins in the Arctic at Arbite Communications, a front organization for... We'll get to that. As you infiltrate the facility, you'll stumble upon radio scattered throughout, which contain some very interesting logs. I eat babies out of every night. Oh, and speaking of teams, you can gather a bunch of your fellow soldiers together as squads like you could towards the end of Half-Life 2 with the Rebels. There weren't many opportunities to link up like this throughout the game, but when the chances arose to do so, as always, they were stupid fun. <laughs> Advancing further into our bite, things begin to make a lot more sense. Well, kinda, but not really. Uh, this is gonna be harder than I thought. 
Then things get trippier and trippier as you begin to encounter what appear to be time anomalies, with past events overlapping the present or time simply freezing altogether. Then, like, ghosts of creatures try to attack you as well? What? What? Yeah, I, I don't even know how to explain this anymore. What is it with you? What's going on up here? There's more people here than you know. The rebels are hiding something huge. The combine are crazy about it, and they need you to secure it for them. Why me? They want this. They need a specialist. But when you're done, they'll throw you out. Bullshit. I'm an asset to the combine. Exactly. Why would they ever want to change that? They will never give you what you want, because that's how they control you. Forget about the damn combine. Let's get what we want together. We don't need them. You expect me to believe that? You've lost it. Don't get in my way, or I'll have to put you down. Plummeting below the facility, things down here look oddly familiar. Not necessarily like anything we've seen from Half-Life, but somewhere else. Why do I always end up in places like this? Dude, this is seriously straight up Portal 1. BINGO! Episode 2 planted the seeds for the universes of Portal and Half-Life to cross over in unprecedented ways. But unfortunately, with Half-Life ending the way it did, we never got to see just to what extent they would intertwine. And Tropy 2 takes it upon itself to truly bring the crossover to life, and it is amazing. Aperture- <gasps> What's all this stuff doing here? Who are you calling weird? You are the one with two legs. What the hell? Who the hell are you? Oh, I'm Wilson. I've been expecting you. <laughs> you no way. Yeah, you're a clone. Said he'd make sure you'd end up here. How do I get out of here? You'll need me if you want to get back to the surface. Uh, I'll have to open some doors for you. Uh, fine. Piece of cake. You'll see. It won't take us long. Piece of cake, he says. No, 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 no. This isn't just Portal. This is Portal with Minecraft horror mods installed. Oh, let me guess. You thought we'd be doing cute little tests down here, eating cake and joking about orphans? No, we're fighting for our lives against a man-eating monster. What the fuck? Is that thing? Which, because of this stupid Blackstone grill or whatever we had to walk through earlier, our weapons were fried, so we literally can't fight it. Now only being able to run or hide. I'll give Breadman credit, as this was a much better stealth section than Entropy 1's attempt. But also, fuck you, Breadman. This is horrifying. You have to make sure you don't make too much noise in certain areas, or make sure you don't wake up zombies lying around, because they'll attract the monster as well. I was sitting there at my desk at 1am, clenching my ass so hard, I'm pretty sure my anal cavity ruptured. Not so fun fact, this beast is actually the gnome from Opposing Force. And they won't be the only thing to return from Opposing Force. Yes, that's right, Paul Blart is back, buddy! A really great little detail I appreciated as well is that in one of the recordings you can find down here, your clone mentions that his voice modulator is damaged during an encounter with the gnome, explaining why his voice now sounds extra glitchy and, let's be honest, evil. It's just a brilliant little in-universe way of explaining the lengths they went to distinguish the clones. After surviving an amnesia-style chase sequence with the gnome, you stumble upon a slideshow by Arbyte Communications in association with... Aperture Science. The slides go into detail about a device not yet created by Aperture, but one to be conceived soon that's already causing temporal disturbances. In simple terms, time travel. Which, while we're on the topic, somebody commented on my episode's reviews that the Borealis seems to be based on the Philadelphia experiment. As a stinky Philadelphian, I am very mad for not making that connection myself. The slides continue, saying that within certain ranges of influence, temporal overlays likened to ghostly apparitions can be observed. However, However, these apparitions are not omens of death or supernatural occurrences. 
Are you sure about that? I'll skim through all the slides here if you want to pause the video to read through them all. We then find where our clone was holed up down here for a little while, and also find out that Judith has been relocated to Arbite 2. And with that, it now becomes a race between us, looking to simply capture Judith for the Combine to interrogate her, and our clone, looking to kill Judith. Finally, we can listen to the exact moment our clone finds out that he has a clone. <laughs> And with that, the illusion has been shattered. To one Aiden Walker, at least. But will our Aiden soon come to the same realization? Or will it be too late? Stocking up on some supplies down here, you're able to finally, and kinda cathartically, kick the shit out of the monstrous bastard who's hunted you all throughout these test chambers. The coward did run away from me for a good portion of the fight, so it wasn't as satisfying killing him as it could have been, but considering all the portal elements incorporated into it as well, it was pretty fun. Afterwards, we obtain arguably my favorite addition that this entire Entropy series makes, Zen Relay Grenades. <laughs> which rip open a wormhole to Zen, sucking anything and everything in its radius into it, including your squad mates. <laughs> <laughs> the catch is, there's also the chance that Zen life forms can spawn from the other side of the grenades, sometimes summoning head crabs, bull squids, and even antlion guardians. It's a perfect dice roll type weapon. Great, of course, for clearing rooms of enemies or even rooms full of mines, and is one of the coolest weapons I've ever seen from a game, period. I guess I should quickly talk about the rest of the additions this game makes now before I steamroll my way through the rest of the story. The pit drones from Opposing Force? Yeah, remember those hoppy little shits? They're here too. Why? Because Opposing Force is great. Why are you questioning it? I was freaking out seeing these guys return. Well, freaking out as much as I possibly could at 2 a.m. now with my fiance sleeping six feet away from me. Oh my god, are those the pit drones from Opposing Force? What are they doing here? Would have been cool to see some of the other Race X guys show up besides the pit drones who are the lamest of them all, but still cool nonetheless. There's also these things called Stuka Bats that randomly show up as well, which were cut creatures from Half-Life 1. And for the final new enemy, we've got Zombie Vortigaunts. What? Zombie what? No way. <laughs> Dude, this freaking mod just gets better and better. I gotta say, I'm kind of surprised these guys weren't already part of the main series. Ooh! Oh, you asshole. And sure, I don't know how much sense zombie vortigons would make, but you could argue a lot of this fan service doesn't make sense. Quite frankly, I don't care. This mod is awesome. To combat all these new enemies, you've got some new weapons to choose from as well, like the MP5K, which typically fires in three round bursts, but alternatively can fire full auto, but with massive recoil. As well as that, instead of a normal pistol, you get this combine pistol that has infinite ammo and can even fire off charged shots. I like this game and I like Wilson. So towards the end of R by one here, I decided to take him with me against his Wilson. He claims that if you do take him with you, he could maybe help you out if you upload him to an AI station in Arbite 3. You don't have to bring him along, it's your choice, but like, actually give me one good reason why you wouldn't bring him along, you piece of shit. The Combine has sent you a few reinforcements, now with your own personal hunter. <laughs> And they also gave you a Tesla Cybertruck complete with a machine gun and rockets. And man, oh man, mowing down enemies with this thing is an absolute blast. It does suck that the car loses a bit of its usefulness with you having to carry Wilson on foot everywhere you go, but... So I learned during the process of editing this that you actually can bring Wilson with you in the car. I did try. I guess I just didn't try hard enough. Once again, I proved myself to be a fucking moron. Why do I review games? I'm, I'm really not built for this. I was going to say, but Wilson can also be used to open specifically locked caches containing supplies, which is a nice little reward for bringing them with you. <sighs> 
I don't deserve any of this, and I probably don't deserve this either, but it's time for me to finally gush about the Arctic. Longtime viewers will know that I love snowy settings in video games. In real life, snow can suck my shriveled balls, but oh man, the Arctic looks so good here! Look at that aurora borealis painting the night sky. Arguably even better looking though, is that sunrise later on in the game. <sighs> oh my god! You can just taste that crisp arctic air. There's also this really cool lake set piece on your way to Arbite too, where you can even find a little Vortigaunt camp with drawings along the cliffside. It's just cool though, probably nothing important since it's just schizophrenic <laughs> ramblings. We also come across this underground monitoring station for Arbite too, and it looks amazing with the cavern opening up above. Hell, there's even the Boyds from Half-Life 1 flying around here. I just realized all that stuff that happened to your clone happened to you too, didn't it? Yes. Wait, really? The artistic direction of the game as a whole for me is just incredible. The interior areas are stunning as well, blooming with neon blues and reds, oranges, lots of sharp contrasting colors, and some really neat lighting and shadows. Sorry, I know I've been nerding out on how the game looks for a little too long now, but I just love it so much. Anyway, there's even more temporal disturbances here with these red looking force fields where anything that goes through them immediately ages and dies. Oh! What? What? Oh, fuck that. No, 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 no. No, no, no. It's also worth noting that up until this point, Wilson and 36 relationship could be summarized with this dialogue. Can I ask you a personal question? Okay. But now, having spent a good bit of time together, 36 does begin to make an effort to really open up to Wilson. Don't name somebody you like then. I like my grandma. Oh, boss, everybody likes their grandma. Look, it's better than nothing, all right? He's doing his best. Oh, okay. Well, that didn't last long. In this other underground section later on, you can see that these caves have become totally overtaken by Zen wildlife, and more notably, Race X wildlife, as you'll remember back in Opposing Force that their portals were pink. I am so happy to see Zen getting this much love again. I really wish Valve gave another crack at it in Half-Life 2. Another reason it's a shame we never got Episode 3, because it definitely seems like Valve was gearing up to take another shot at it there. After passing through the Zen infested tunnels, you finally arrive at Arbite 2. What? It's here that we finally catch up to Judith, and Entropy 2's place in the Half-Life timeline is made crystal clear. Holy shit. It's her. 3650 to Overwatch. Target sighted. Preparing to engage. She is here. Send it all in. <laughs> Stack up and prep for breach. Let's bust both floors. Come on. Don't waste any time. Prep those charges. What's the hold up? Lock the doors. She's coming away. Syncing things up so perfectly like that is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. When you do catch up to Judith for real this time, you blow her brains out. Yeah! Your clone turns out to be right on your tail, leading you escorting Judith away from Arbite. The advisor's pleased that you've taken care of your primary objective, and now you've been assigned a new one. With that, we're now heading through Aperture's Entropic Control Facility. Here, the anomalies get even funkier, finding yourself transported into the Borealis. Eventually, because you have not been reasonable at all with your clone, I'm an asset to the combine. They see something in us. Does that turn you on, Aiden? Does that do it for you? The two of you duke it out in one of the nuttiest fights I've ever been a part of, with manhack swarming your ass as your clone teleports all over the room, not to mention the frickin' resonance cascade casually occurring in the background. Don't worry about it, it's fine. The fight climaxes with the two of you being transported once again into the Borealis, where you can fire off on an explosive barrel, setting your clone on fire. Unfortunately, after that encounter with your clone, Wilson isn't feeling so good. I'm not gonna make it. You're gonna be fine. No. No, you're fine. You're yelling at me. I'm not mad. I'm, I'm just... I'm gonna get you uploaded, remember? I don't blame you for being angry at the world. Don't do this. Don't blame yourself. 
there are some things in life you don't get over. It's a fact of life, boss. You gotta accept that. Don't. Yes. Remember, I believed you. Olsen, stay with me. You read the ship, boss. Ship? Yeah, the whole heart-to-heart -heart thing before dying is cliche. I don't care. I teared up. And if you didn't, you're a coward. At long last, you reached the AI upload station Wilson was referring to back at Arbite 1. Despite now being a useless bucket of bolts, we throw a Hail Mary and attempt to upload Wilson to the station anyway. Meanwhile, we at long last arrive at the Borealis. And I love, love, love that they use the GOAT Doug Ratman's theme from Portal here. Perfect. Just perfect. And then you meet with your clone for one final confrontation. This is the end. For us. For you. They're letting me keep my faculties. They told me. You're like me now. Now you know the truth. You can't hide that from them. They're in your head. They can't trust you anymore. No! I can prove it to them. You know they can't help you. You don't need them. You're wrong. I'm done trying to resolve your past. I'm done with my life. It's our past. No. You gave everything for this privilege. Remember? Put me out. And before I could even think about my decision, he comedically had a fucking shipping container <laughs> dropped right on top of him. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, that's really funny. The advisor offers you another promotion. Well, maybe offers isn't the right word, because it's mandatory. Uh, he wants to wipe your memory. Refusing the promotion enrages the grub, leading to another insane battle, as the advisor telekinetically throws everything in the room it possibly can at you. Sort of like the Nihilanth code in Black Mesa. You can even use Zen grenades here to summon Vortigons to help you take down the advisor. This mod just thinks of everything. After the fight and shooting these things, we ripped open another temporal event. Wait, what? Whoa! <laughs> Dude, that's awesome! <laughs> Back on the Borealis again. Whoa. <gasps> Every time I forget about him. God damn it. The G-Man explains that he owes you one. <laughs> about that. Beer, I owe you. Thanks to all the work you did back in City 10, as well as your exploits involving this ship, you've bought the G-Man some time. Like 45 seconds. As repayment, while G-Man can't bring your daughter back, he can either tell you what happened to your daughter, or allow you to kill the grub carrying the original copy of your consciousness, keeping the Combine from replicating you from now on. I'm guilty of a lot of things, but I didn't kill my daughter. Maybe knowing that is enough. I don't want them to use my memories anymore. Do it. With that, you're transported to some sort of combine cloning room where you curb stomp the host carrying your imprint. The G-Man then transports you to your old room, but suddenly has to leave. You're then sucked into a wormhole, re-emerging in a combine facility as you find yourself being experimented on by the combine looking to break through your mental barriers. But before the advisor can continue testing... Huh? I was about to say, I think I really made the wrong choice. <gasps> I found yes! Wilson. The Combine are trying to get the ship back. We can't let them have it, boss. We gotta get you out of here. It's not much, but I found you a gun. Okay. What's the plan? Going into this series, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel. How are you going to make me sympathize with this guy who willingly joins the evil interdimensional space empire that subjugates planets and takes away people's free will without me feeling bad about myself? But they somehow did it. 
And that's some damn good writing. I received literally hundreds of comments telling me to check out Entropy Zero, especially Entropy 2. And well, you guys were right. Entropy Zero 2 is genuinely on par with several official Half-Life titles. Ooh, dude, that was perfect timing on his part. Why am I shooting my own teammate? I'd go as far as to say I think it's better than Blue Shift, better than Episode 1, which shouldn't be too surprising if you know how I feel about those, but I loved Opposing Force, and I'd say Entropy 2 is a good bit above that as well. It comes with a plethora of great ideas, fantastic writing, some nice little fan service here and there. Does it make sense? No. It's a fan-made mod. Who fucking cares? Anyway, yeah, the writing is fantastic. It really got some good laughs out of me here and there. Friends. Shut it. Don't make this weird. Kept me intrigued the whole way through with the storyline of the clone, and by the end was tugging on my heartstrings. And it looks like I checked out Entropy Zero at the perfect time, as they recently announced a couple new installments that seem to be coming to the series pretty soon. And like I said at the beginning of the video, this mod is almost like the Half-Life 3 or Episode 3 that we never got. And look, I've made it no secret that I'm really a new fan to Half-Life, having only checked out the series for the first time around last December. But Man, did it still hurt like a bitch watching those credits roll at the end of episode 2, knowing the fate of the Half-Life universe was a mystery from this terribly bleak point going forward. Sure, Half-Life Alex had something to say about that, but to this day, about 17 years later, we still haven't had a proper continuation. But Entropy Zero 2 has honestly made me okay with that, I think. There's still so many brilliant stories that can be told within the Half-Life universe from this point, from fresh perspectives. So yeah, Half-Life may never officially return, but thanks to the wonderfully talented Breadmen team and their work, like on Entropy Zero 2, I think I'm at peace with that. Just when I thought I was out, they pull me right back in!